everybody. Um, David Bowles here. Uh, I'm a Mexican-American author of speculative fiction, and I'm going to chat with you for about 35, 40 minutes, and then those of you who want to join me on Discord for some Q&A at the end of that can. Let me go ahead and share my screen so that I can not just have my face floating in front of you, but actually have uh, words and images for us to t talk about and take a look at. Um, so the, the uh, title of this talk is Ancestral Past and Anchored Future Toward a Mexican-American Futurism. One of the things to do as a sort of preamble is to think a little bit about the lack of representation and its impact, lack of representation for Mexican-Americans specifically, but more broadly uh, for uh, communities of color in publishing and then of course more specifically speculative fiction so people from communities of color are underrepresented in publishing just flat out i think everyone understands that our, our books make up less than six percent of the titles released each year and that's despite a century of fighting against gatekeepers the results of this systematic um, and systemic exclusion are clear we also get elided from the national conversation beginning in elementary school because the books that children are exposed to um, center whiteness and um, mirror whiteness in ways that uh, make children grow up assuming that that's the default. Uh, those of us who live in this country, we are trained by textbooks, libraries, classrooms, TV and cinema to see life in the United States as almost exclusively white. And if you think about it hard, literary and intellectual life are clearly constructed to make us invisible in those spheres. And that project is complicit in promoting the racist white hegemony, you know, controlling power that is even now morphing into white nationalist fascism. There may be people who perhaps disagree with me in terms of politics, but I think it is really, really clear that when communities of color are excluded from the the nation's self-image then people in the nation whether they're from those communities of color or not um, begin to see whiteness as the default and other people as somehow lesser right the consequences in science fiction are are multiple but as a mexican-american author who writes for both children and adults i grapple with the view of the future that the publishing world is constructed in science fiction. Uh, when I was growing up, I was a huge science fiction fan in the 70s and 80s, uh, reading, you know, books from the golden age of science fiction and so forth. It became very clear to me even then as a young person that the corpus uh, projects the existing inequities of white fundamentalist capitalism forward in time so that our present erasure as Mexican Americans, black people, indigenous people, uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders so forth becomes permanent in the future. And there's this neoliberal homogeneity um, in the future that's decidedly white, despite some superficial racial diversity um, espoused in, in, some, in some science fiction projects like you know, whatever Star Trek and, and Sulu and Uhura, for example, right? <clears throat> the roots of this inescapable inequity that we have projected into the future um, obviously arise from the colonial project that, that violently transformed the Americas, you know, the arrival of the British and the Spanish and the Portuguese and eventually other European empires uh, to invade this area and make it their own. Writer Alberto Chimal, uh, a very um, well-known and, and uh, award-winning Mexican author of speculative fiction, um, talking about Mexico with words that apply equally to the U.S., describes the problem in just really clear terms, really stark terms. This is a country with a history of racism that even predates its formation as an independent nation. 500 years of systematic and constant oppression against its native peoples. Ours is a racism so internalized in the dominant culture, so exclusive and embedded with other prejudices 
that it has completely denied an equitable, varied, and abundant representation of indigenous populations in national media. And he could have also talked about um, Black representation, um, Afro-Mexicano representation, because that has also been enlightened uh, as part of this project in Mexico. And like I say, those words can apply to the U.S. as well, although the U.S. has many other layers of, of, of the oppressive onion that is our culture, right? In the U.S., that oppression that Alberto describes has been compounded by 300 years of enslavement of Black people, another century of systemic exclusion of Black people. Then the tools that were just so carefully and um, craftily constructed during that period of time to oppress Black people um, and to, to dehumanize them, then got employed against Latinx, Asian, and Pacifica communities as well. Um, not to mention, of course, the, the project of essentially genocide against indigenous people that was ongoing throughout this entire period. Um, so in a country that's so determined to keep liberty out of the hands of everyone but white folks, it's no surprise, frankly, that the mainstream view of the future features white people facing off against aliens who are essentially ciphers for the groups that they've already wreaked violence upon in U.S. history. Um, and, and if, you know, again, things are changing now and have been changing for several decades, like slowly you get, you know, more and more books from people from these underrepresented groups that are, that espouse a different worldview, but the, the vast corpus of science fiction uh, um, writing espouses this kind of view of the future. And I mean, not as something deliberate, but to something that just comes by instinct to white writers when they're thinking about the future. Progress has been depicted by most science fiction as a deeply white concept. The rest of us could yearn to be part of the chosen remnant that enjoys a colonial mythic future, but anything essential about us was missing from those narratives. People of color, people from communities of color that show up in those books are essentially like brown and black faced white people for the most part, right? So we come to, to what it would mean to articulate other possibilities to steal a phrase from a good friend of mine, the Ayuk writer, activist and linguist Yasnaya Aguilar. She invites us to wonder how the world might function without capitalism, colonialism, or patriarchy, even while worrying that our concrete imaginations might not fully suffice. She says, a large part of the universes of the future are hijacked by the oppressive systems of the present. So it seems logical that even their future denial be contrasted with their current reality. And so, I mean, you, you might take this as kind of depressing, right? It's, it, it is colonialism so deeply embedded um, in even communities of color and the way we see ourselves and the way we think about our possible futures that we can't imagine futures that are different from our present in terms of like social dynamics and so forth. Mm, but Yasna, yeah, kind of wants to assure us that that there are, there's a way to to articulate the future um, differently than that. She assures us there are possibilities um, latent in that imagined future, articulated from other places of enunciation, spaces that historically have neither had a future nor have been considered as cutting edge at all. Uh, and I love that because so much you know, of this projection of you know, hegemonic white culture into the future is based on the assumption that whatever is the most technologically advanced at the moment is what's going to survive into the future. And she argues that that may be, you know, a, a misguided perspective that there, that there are things that may endure into the future that we, that, you know, people who live on that cutting edge of technology, that is um, perhaps one of the fundamentals of white liberalism. Um, can't quite wrap their minds around it. just doesn't occur to them that that could happen. Um, a quick side step so we can talk about futurism and, and place Mexican American futurism in the context. So Afrofuturism has been around the longest. Um, black creators were the first in the US to articulate the possibilities that Yasnaya suggests. 
um, with a worldview anchored in the fraught past and present, plus a host of different cultural assumptions than white hegemony, writers and musicians and others began in the mid 20th century to produce speculative art with distinctly black aesthetics. That broad tendency in 1993 was retroactively dubbed Afrofuturism. Um, and, and the name has stuck, right? And there are different varieties of it in the present. Sociologist Alondra Nelson, when talking about how Afrofuturism needs to be seen as something broader than just like a, a literary movement for thinking about the future, says Afrofuturism should be a big tent of expanding borders of the possibilities for Black life, while also defining it broadly as visions of the future, including science, technology, and its cultures in the laboratory, social theory, and in aesthetics, through the experience and perspective of African diasporic communities, right? African American principally, but also Afro Latino and then so forth, right? There is something um, special about Afrofuturism and the way it intersects with um, African American people, black people in the US um, that we might call a salvational transformational power of Afrofuturism. C. Brandon Ogbunu argues for the salvational transformational power of Afrofuturism because it arises from Black people's historical struggle for existence, the right to live, to be considered a person, to be afforded basic rights and pursuit of political, social, economic equality. And rather than focus on predicting advanced technology, which is just like the you know bread and butter of, of science fiction um, before these kinds of movements. Afrofuturism asks who will make those gadgets, right? Is it gonna be the white people? Or are we gonna have a bunch of brown and black people, you know, in factories alongside robots making them, right? And who will be oppressed by them? That's a, that is an interesting question, right? Who is gonna be oppressed by the gadgets of the future? And it wonders how the tech would be deployed in a world predicated on African-American values and culture rather than white American ones. Because while there's overlap, obviously they're different, right? Um, one of the, the, the tenets or aspects of futurism broadly is this notion of reimagining the present into the future or like dreaming an alternate present as a possible future. So when you employ an Afrofuturist lens, you can focus it on the present as well and recognize that while the community has lived and continues to live in an enduring dystopic state, a better future in the worlds of Alondra Nelson, who I quoted before, always being imagined, embodied, dreamed, and constituted in everyday acts of thriving. Just the, 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 the act of not merely surviving, but thriving in the present um, on, on the terms of Black people themselves rather than terms that are imposed on them is um, is Afrofuturist, she argues, right? So Afrofuturism in effect affords the black community a roadmap to resistance through culturally deployed technology, tools to building a more just, equitable and colorful world, et cetera. And so, you know, if you're thinking about this, you can see it's imp the implications of Afrofuturism for other underrepresented groups. <clears throat> Indigenous futurism is the, the next of these, you know, community specific movements uh, or ways of thinking about um, speculation about the future. In 2003, uh, taking the Afrofuturist framework and applying it to the work of native writers in the US, uh, uh, Anishinaabe science fiction critic, edit and editor and scholar, Grace Dillon coined the term indigenous futurism. Like Afrofuturism, it refuses assimilation and reconciliation narratives, which is what a lot of, you know, readers of traditional science fiction would prefer that people from these communities do, right? And chooses instead to predict the survival and resistance of indigenous peoples against systems of genocidal oppression. Pushing back against both ignorant and non-native scholarly views of indigenous culture as relegated to the distant past 
and non-urban geography. Creators like Rebecca Roanhorse, Stephen Graham Jones, and Darcy Little Badger center native lives, concerns, and culture in the present and the imagined future, whether it be you know, near future uh, science fiction or you know, more epic, um, far-flung futurism. So that brings us to the notion going, you know, from Northern American indigenous futurism to Mesoamerican futurism. And by Mesoamerican futurism, I guess we, we're, we're talking about essentially indigenous futurism in what is Mexico, what is now Mexico and Central America, Mesoamerica. In his article, Mexafuturismo, Mexican author Alberto Chimal, that, who I've already cited once before, advocates for further expansion of Afrofuturism using its tenets to contemplate the reality of other groups that have been abused and oppressed for centuries. He proposes a Mexafuturism through which writers might bring together works that already interrogate Mexican racism and then craft stories that blow up the myth of indigenous inferiority and submission, proposing different routes of transformation and development than traditional racist discourses the veiled deferment proposed by neoliberalism and new contemporary fascisms. And so, like the last couple lines of that are, are, are pretty a stinging indictment of the two sides of the polit political spectrum, both in Mexico and the US. You know, the neoliberal side represented by mainstream Democrats in, in the US and, and, and by similar parties in Mexico, and then you know, contemporary fascisms represented by maybe by the Republican Party in the U.S. and like the PAN and, uh, and other right wing groups in Mexico. The veiled deferment proposed, the deferment of what deferment of the full enjoyment of, of social justice and rights by people who are underrepresented, indigenous people, black people and so forth. Just, just a, a really, I mean, Alberto Timal, great writer, great thinker, great, um, proponent of this type of uh, view of the future. <clears throat> I want to now start moving towards that. <laughs> I mean, we're, the, the, the subtitle of this is Towards the Mexican-American Futures, and so here we're moving towards it step by step. The um, indigenous metaphors for future that arise out of this this kind of like conversation between Alberto and Yasnaya. Shimon points to the work of the Yasnaya Aguila as a crucial starting point. As a native speaker and scholar of an indigenous tongue, the Ayuk linguist sees in lexicon and semantics an entry point into Mesoamerican futurism. Um, I mean, her article is really fantastic, by the way. I mean, it's in Spanish, so I've translated excerpts from it, but it's definitely worth reading if you're able to read Spanish. Other indigenous languages, such as, uh, such as Mije, my mother tongue, which is spoken in the state of Oaxaca in the south of Mexico, also use a linear metaphor for movement through time, only that it is placed in a vertical position and the future falls to us, passing through the body and showering us with time. Mimp que takp. The basic possibilities offered by the languages that we just happen to speak provide us with our initial metaphors for speaking of the future. And you can see then how Ayuk people who speak Mije, an indigenous language that, that configures time in that way, vertically rather than horizontally, um, can conceive of future differently than something that you're rushing toward. It's something that's falling toward you. Um, and the implications for indigenous, you know, Mesoamerican uh, futurism are multiple there. Yasnaya goes on to argue that the present that is lived by indigenous people in Mexico is futurism, but futurism for like ancestors and the ancestral vision of the future or, or the dream of the future that maybe some of them could have had. She encourages indigenous creators in Mexico to take heart in the fact that these languages like um, Ayu, uh, like Mije, which the Ayu people speak, or Nahuatl, like Nahua speaks throughout Mexico, um, have survived to the present despite the wars of conquest, famines, epidemics, and enslavement that wiped out three quarters of the native population, causing their societies to collapse and the world as they knew it to disappear. And this is what she says. 
in these circumstances, the chances that in the 21st century, the indigenous peoples of that moment, 500 years earlier, would continue to exist, speaking our languages and recreating our own forms of organization must have seemed implausible. Against all odds, our structures have come this far into this future. We are in the future, the, the, the hoped for, dreamed of future of the indigenous people that were, whose homelands were being invaded at the time of, uh, you know, 500 years ago when, when the Spanish arrived in Mesoamerica. And, I think, and that's a really, really poignant and powerful perspective to take, to see that like, you know, it, as people are dying all around you, it's really hard to say 500 years hence, our descendants will still be around. They'll be using technology to deploy our language and our ideas and, and, our, and our faith and, and our values. Uh, it would have been really, really hard for people 500 years ago to imagine that as they were, you know, as their homelands were being invaded. But it is nonetheless um, what, what the indigenous people in Mexico are living right now. So, you know, that allows indigenous people to, to imagine the indigenous, indigenous world in future tense to, as she says, conjugate the world in future tense. Aguilar finds not only optimism in this endurance, but also an answer to ongoing dystopia. It seems inevitable that we are facing a climate catastrophe, but indigenous communities in Mexico can perceive that their response to these challenges, their vision of the future on the other side of the catastrophe needs to be just as rooted in knowledge gleaned in the past as the responses of their ancestors to a similar catastrophe five centuries ago. Starting with those lessons, Aguilar contends, we can write futures using multiple and diverse spatial metaphors. That's the wager, the possibility of conjugating our world and the future tense. Um, again, just a powerful writer um, like Alberto and her article, which is also in Spanish, is something I definitely think that you should take a look at. So that brings us to, to Mexican Americans and Mexicans, um, not indigenous, de-indigenized arguably um, because of conquest and so forth, but um, a people who exist in this kind of like liminal space between indigenous and European. Uh, most Mexicans and Mexican Americans, um, although some of them are, are more indigenous than others and have are rooted more in indigenous communities. But the majority, I would argue, find ourselves in a difficult place. Though partly of indigenous descent, we exist in what Chicana philosopher Gloria Saldua termed Nepantla, this liminal space I suggested that exists between the European and native cultures um, whose forced merging, or uh, although it's kind of difficult perhaps to speak of it as an equal merging and more of an absorption of native culture into the Spanish colonial culture um, gave rise to to us, to, to Mexicans and Mexican-Americans who don't have a particular indigenous group that we know we belong to any longer after 500 years, right? This word, Nepantla, which translates to the middle, comes from the Nahuatl language. And um, it was once spoken throughout all of what is now Mexico and Mesoamerica spoken down in Central America because, for multiple reasons, one of them being the expansion of the Aztec Empire, the Triple Alliance, it's you, the use of the language as a lingua franca, and then the use of Nahuatl by colonial era Spanish missionaries who found it easier to reach indigenous groups by using an indigenous language. Um, than using Spanish, so for about 100 years after the Spanish invasion, one of the main languages used in missionary work to um, convert, to strip indigenous people of their their like their community's religion was this language, Nahuatl. So it is arguably, um, in the view of many Mexican Americans, many Chicanx people, um, part of the heritage that we have, <clears throat> this pre-invasion and colonial Nahua tradition that informs a lot of our culture, the stories that we are told when we're children and so forth. Um, and the language is like embedded in Mexican Spanish and, and a lot of the terms we use on a daily basis. 
so some of us, myself included, set out to to study Nahuatl and, and, and learn it as a way, um, you know, to, as, as a language of one set of our ancestors, as a way to help us decolonize our, our lives and our minds and um, better center, better to find a better equilibrium between the indigenous and European part, because the indigenous part was, has been, you know, nearly elided from our culture uh, throughout the, the project of first New Spain and then the, the Re Republic of Mexico. <clears throat> so when we think about that language and we think about Yasnaya's ideas of, of taking a look at metaphors um, for time and so forth, I, I think there's like this really powerful way of reconceptualizing the um, the way we um, think about the future. So I, I you know I've studied classical Nahuatl, the, the language that was spoken at the time of the invasion for a long time and I've taken Yasnaya's advice when trying to articulate the aims of my fellow Mexican American writers of speculative fiction using novel to, to kind of to better conceptualize the kind of work we're doing. Before the Spanish invasion, time was relative to the Nahuas, these, these interrelated peoples, such as the Mexica um, and, and their allies that were broadly called the Aztecs um, by uh, future historians, and the Tlaxcalteca, etc. Though Nahuatl has both past and future tenses, the classic dialect had no simple word for past or future. Instead, distance was the key. The past in Nahuatl is the place time we're coming from. The future is the place time we're headed toward. And I'm using this term place time because the locative words um, could stand both for places or time. So for example, Chopin could mean a green place or it can mean the green time or spring. So it, there is this kind of continuity uh, or synonymity of time and place. Now, we've seen in, in our kind of like survey of different types of BIPOC futurisms that they can serve as tools for portraying the alternate present that we deserve as a future we wish to manifest, bringing into existence a relevant responsive time far from now that is rooted in a time long before now, so that ancestral past meets speculative future. In Nahuatl, that ancestral past and speculative future are called by the same name, Wekan, which it means literally distant place time. It's related to a pair of relevant terms, Wekawa, to be ancient, to be from distant times, and Wekatlatoa, which is to prophesy about the future. So their distance is anchored to or measured from this place here the word nikan, which can mean here or this place or this time also. As an alternative then to the English word futurism, discourse about speculative future or ancient past could be called weka tlatoli, a distant deep old words would be a great way to, to, to call it. Then nikan weka tlatoli names those futurisms rooted not just in the past, but in the past of this place here where our ancestors lived and loved and dreamed and died. So when I look at the work of speculative writers of the Mexican diaspora, I can preserve, perceive rather, <laughs> what is what I call the mecayotl or eternal braided rope of community stretching back into the mist of ancestral past and ahead into the dreamed of place times in which ancestral ways can blend with innovative technology plus all the stops in between. And um, mecatl is a word that means like rope and mecayot, it means um, like lineage or like some kind of strand that connects people in distant places and distant times. Nikan Huecatlatoli, this um, kind of Mex Mexican or Mexican American futurism sees time as cyclical. For Mesoamerican peoples before the Spanish invasion, the world had been made, destroyed, and remade multiple times, right? We're now in the fifth age of the fifth sun. 
Um, those eras or suns weren't devolutions from some golden age. We hadn't fallen from perfection into imperfection. In each era, the gods tried to do better to find the best balance between chaos and order rather than good and evil in the Western tradition, to craft thinking beings who could best steward the earth. The raw materials of the, materials of the previous age were, were used to build the next. The earth herself was a retooling of the primal Leviathan called Sibakli. Just as each sun, each era, carries the DNA of the one before, you know, the kernel, the essence of it, the sort of futurism we Mexican-American writers embrace projects the culture, language, beliefs of the here-rooted past of our ancestors into the future. There's no break, there's no abandoning of local lore for universal science. Instead, the two blend. They twine together, they are braided and threaded together as part of the same, um, you know, mechayatu that I was talking about before, the, the eternal braid. An important thing to note about all of this, whether it's Afrofuturism, Indigenous Futurism, Futurism, any of these underrepresented groups, is that futurism what like makes it to, to me what makes it essentially distinct from just like regular writing about the future is that it pulls from lived experience right and there's tons of speculative fiction by folks who aren't mexican chicanx or more broadly latinx that uses cultural elements characters and language from latin american indigenous or mestizo culture blended culture it's something that's always missing from that work, no matter how good, because it doesn't arise out of lived experience. It's a member of a community whose like, mores are rooted in ancestral past. So if a writer hasn't grown up in a culture that exists in that continuum, for which ancestral past is also more than logical present, they will likely end up writing a traditional white sci-fi story with exotic names and rights. Um, and that, you know, exoticizing of of the the cultures of underrepresented groups is really really prevalent in a lot of the bandwagoning you know that you see happening in um, literature right now where people think that diversity is the trend or the fad of the moment and they, they want to participate in that by bringing in um, all kinds of exotic locales and characters now hey nothing wrong with that it's not the end of the world that people do that there's entertainment value in them. Still, they don't usually reflect the lived experiences of the communities they depict in the future. So it's not futurism when they do that. Um, many of us Mexican American creators feel ourselves guided by tradition and identity to do more than simply entertain, although we want to entertain also, right? And now what the, the word is a mecachiwa, cord weaving, the creation of the mecayotl that I was talking about adding strands to cultural mecayotl or shaping new connections between the wekan behind and the wekan ahead, right? The ancestral past and the dreamed of future on the loom of nikan ashkan, the here and now. Those who do that work are more than just Latinx writers of speculative fiction. Although, I mean, the label is fine. We are mecachiwanime, weavers of the cord. And for my part, as a Mekachiwani, my goal is more than selling books, although, yes, of course, I want to sell books, right? My goal is to manifest for my people futures near and distant that echo ancestral past. And sometimes to even weave alternate presents that, that help us to, to reimagine that lineage and, and see it moving in different directions into the future. And when you do that kind of work, the cord weaving, um, then books can become a sort of sacred conduit. So in my own Nikan Wekatlatoli, my own futurism, both the ideal yet forgotten ancestral place time and the ideal yet unrealized here rooted speculative future are Tamuanchan, which is a name from now uh, mythology uh, that's a, a place of gardens that's tended by the goddess Xochiquetzal. Um, it's also called Ejecaxaxantlan, um, where winds shatter, the place where winds shatter. And I always imagine that it means the place where winds shatter, the oppressive present, right? It shatter it, destroy it, and allow something else to be built from its ruins. 
the sacred stories say that the Toltec Tlamatinime, uh, the sages, left this world to travel to Tamuanchan. It awaits, ready by Tonansin, our beloved mother, the, the, uh, a title given to many goddesses, accessible to those whose hearts and minds lie open to the wormhole that is Mekayotl, along which our people can slide to Wekan behind and before us. In the pages of our books, they can find that sacred conduit and move back and forth. Which is, you know, I think, what a lot of us want to do. We're, you know, we're writing primarily for people in our community and then for other people um, whose minds and hearts are open to these kinds of things as well and, and who can find, you know, insight and entertainment and inspiration and then like a new understanding of like who we are through these kinds of books. Here's um, a couple of of series of my, I've, I've, I've got like 26 books out, but um, I wanted to talk about two series that have launched this year. Um, one of them is my space opera series, The Path. Um, the Path is set 700 years in the future um, in, in a time when you know, white hegemony has been overcome, but corporate capitalism has not. And the the kind of like coalition of of planets uh, that exists that humans live on is called the consortium of planets, corporations, and colonies. And everything is very much driven by corporate mindset and, and capitalism and is, you know, the end all do all of, of people's behaviors within the consortium, but there are independent worlds that lie outside of it. And a lot of these independent worlds are, you know, were founded by like Afro indigenous Latinx people essentially, but like 700 years in the future, they don't use those terms for themselves. Um, you have the Nahuatl, you have the Simeriane, you have um, the Joviane, you have a, a different a series of groups um, that are in, in many ways related to Mexican Americans of the present or Latinx of the present and, uh, and stand in for them in the future. And it is, you know, the books are about how through a series of, of harrowing circumstances, these independent worlds end up finding a way forward, a, a way to, to, to break corporate capitalism for all human beings and put humanity on a new path. Um, towards a future that is better for everybody, and not just for their communities, but for all humans. Um, and uh, the, the first three books are coming out this year. So the Blue Spangled Blue uh, came out a few months ago, um, The Deepest Green, July 13th, um, and then The Rising Red comes out in November. And then next year, the last book, The Swirling Black, comes out. Um, and and in, so you know, a lot of it is is playing with this is a world, there's a world called Semenawak in, in which novel is uh, the, like the lingua franca um, and a lot of different indigenous groups live there and they're kind of w one of the main groups and pushing this this new future um uh, pushing humanity towards this this new path into a better future um another series of mine that's launching this year is the clockwork curandera series which is a graphic novel series um that i created with raul gonzalez raul the third and it's set in 1865 in like an alternate past where um, steampunk technology and indigenous magic coexist in what's called the Repu Republic of Santander, which is essentially like two of the northern states of Mex uh, present in Mexico and in South Texas, this area that my family is from, um, you know, have th it's its own nation. And the main character, um, Cristina Franco, is an apprentice curandera, an apprentice a healer, a shaman, who gets attacked by lechuzas, which is who transform into like massive owls, and is left for dead. But her brother, who's an alchemist, brings her back to life using novel spells and, and alchemy and, and technology. And um, then, as a basically a cyborg who can wield. Um, indigenous magic, um, she sets out to find out what's going on and, and to protect her, her nation from, from this strange menace that is slowly unveiled over the course of the series. So um, just this is one of those like trying to imagine, trying to imagine the end of the, the 19th century in a way that allows indigeneity to be more a part of people's lives and a part of the 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 running of the government and so forth than it actually is 
actually was in our past because then you know those elements help i think help us to imagine a future in which we can like kind of like take up what's been abandoned or erased and reincorporate them into our lives so here are the three articles that i cited um uh, Yasna Aguilar es una Mesoamérica distópica, uh, Alberto Chimal's Mexa Futurismo, and then C. Brandon of Bunu's How Afrofuturism Can Help the World Mend, uh, all of which are just really, really great articles. And here's some recommended reading um, if you want to, to dig a little bit more deeply into Mexican American futurism as it stands right now. Um, there are um, works of both the fiction and scholarly works taking a look at uh, you know Latinx or, uh, or Mexican or Mexican American futurism definitely um, take a screenshot of this because this, this is your assigned reading I, I think that you will you come away um, come away feeling really really good at having exposed yourself to to this wonderful new corpus of literature that is beginning to evolve. And so now I'm gonna pop over into Discord. So if there are questions, um, you can go ahead and ask them and I will do my very best to answer them. Thank you so much for your patience, for listening to some of these ideas and que pasen muy buenas tardes. Have a great evening and afternoon.